Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Cultural appropriation, the adoption of elements of one culture for use in another, has become a lightning rod in the arguments over identity politics that are beginning to define our age. Now, the American author Lionel Shriver, winner of the Orange Prize for Fiction, has waded in. Speaking at the Brisbane Writers' Festival, she said that it was a fad and that without authors writing from the perspective of other cultures, we wouldn't have, for example, most of Graham Greene's novels. Shriver so incensed the writer Yasmin abdel Magid that she walked out, saying that the speech was a poisoned package wrapped up in arrogance and delivered with condescension. Well, Lionel Shriver joins us from New York and Yasmin abdel Magid is with us here in the studio. Uh, good evening to you both and I warn you that there is a big delay on the line to uh, Lionel in America. But Lionel Shriver, first of all, um, you dismissed the whole idea of cultural appropriation as a fad so what is your problem with it? Well, I'll speak particularly to uh, the issue as a fiction writer. Uh, our, my occupation is all about uh, trying to be empathetic with people very different from myself, not simply to tell my own story. Uh, that's memoir, and if you tell fiction writers that they have to only represent their own experience and not anyone else's. They don't write fiction. They write memoir. This, it's the end of my occupation. So um, I also just think the whole spirit of fiction is one of, of generosity and inquiry. And uh, it, it's, it's a good side of ourselves. And I'm, I'm not just for writers, but for readers. Uh, we want to get out of ourselves. We want to learn about others and imaginatively project ourselves into other people's experience. And I think that this is in the interests of minority groups and people who feel um, that maybe hitherto they've been ignored. Now, you know, it's, it's good not to be ignored. It's good not to be ignored. Well, Yasmin, you actually walked out of this speech before the end. Now, what was it that so incensed you by what uh, Lionel said? I think the concept of whether fiction writers can or can't write another person's story is almost not what I... It wasn't the reason I walked out. So the reason I walked out was because the concept of saying identity is not important or cultural appropriation is a fad was almost humiliating. It was this kind of mockery of the fact that something could be important to me and that actually the bits of identity that I value and the bits of, and the bits of culture that I value... Um, were to be laughed at essentially and and if I was upset or if I had any concerns about those things being used as a tool for a story that was the fact that I was too sensitive. So so let, let, let's be quite careful before I go back to, to Lionel on this. In terms of tools for a story do you believe for example that you know I don't know a German writer can write about uh, the life of uh, a Sudanese farmer, for example. You have an issue with people writing and, uh, and uh, developing characters that are not of your own culture identity. Not at all. And I think that's something, that's something that's been lost, right? I'm not saying that people can't write other identities. However, fiction exists in a reality. Fiction doesn't exist in a vacuum. So how should people write other characters? And what and which voices are missing is really what this is about. Right. So, so Lionel Shriver, it seems to be that it's about taking hold of other people's voices and not allowing them to speak for themselves. So, you know, determining what stories about different cultural identities are the important ones. Um, there's nothing about uh, telling. Uh, other people's story imaginatively that keeps um, keeps people from um, the groups that you were representing in your book from also telling their own story. I mean, the more stories, the merrier, as far as I'm concerned. And um, I fear that Yasmin is misrepresenting the whole concept of uh, cultural appropriation, which is extremely restrictive, and uh, basically says that you cannot use 
uh, 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 practices, expressions, uh, uh, whatever from other people's cultures uh, for yourself without permission. And I'm not quite sure how we're supposed to get that permission either. Well, let, let's talk about two things first it of all. It actually makes it uh, potentially uh, offensive to go to an ethnic res restaurant. Yeah, and in fact, funny enough, you wore a sombrero at the end of your speech because what you were talking about when you started your speech was the idea that students at a university holding a tequila party shouldn't have worn sombreros and actually were censored by the university for doing so. So that's where cultural appropriation has been in that space, the whole idea of cultural appropriation. But bringing it on to fiction now, I think what Yasna is saying is, saying is that only certain kinds of depictions right. of particular ethnic groups are acceptable. And your view, presumably, is that as a fiction writer, anything is acceptable that you choose to write about. And Are you talking to me? Yeah, yes, yeah, so I'm very sorry, that made the delay yeah. even longer, <laughs> I'm terribly right. sorry. But see, what, but, but, what, what, tends, you to happen, well, what tends to happen is that um, the people that get, the people whose voices are heard and who have the platform tend to write similar stories about d demographics. So, for example, as a young Muslim woman, for example, the types of stories that exist about me are quite often p seen from the outside and exoticized and are deemed, uh, steeped in a history that I don't have much control over, right? So even though fiction writers create stories, those stories exist in a reality that then affect... But, the, but, but, the, but they only exist in the, in the fiction. Well, no, because sometimes that's the only experience somebody has with a particular demographic. So, but when it comes to that, j just to nail this one, when it comes to uh, Alina wearing a sombrero at the end of her, her speech, which you weren't actually, is that offensive in itself? Well, what is the intent? What is the intent? Is the intent to make mockery of something somebody else sees as important and sacred? Like, I don't think mockery is important. I don't, think, I don't think we should go out and want to humiliate people who say, you know what, this is important to me. Let's have, rather, let's have a conversation about why this is important. Well, well let me just put that to Lionel. I mean, were you intent on mockery when you were wearing the sombrero at the end of your speech? I was attempting to have a sense of humor. And um, I'm sorry that Yasmin took it that way. And she couldn't have been offended because she walked out in the middle of my speech and she you know, didn't see me put on a hat. It was just a bit of theatricality. It was for fun. And um, it was illustrating the last line of the speech, which was that uh, we fiction writers need to be allowed to wear many hats, including a sombrero. And I put the hat on and took the Q&A thereafter. And it, there was no element of mockery in my speech, but there was a certain amount of playfulness because when you take this concept uh, too far, it began, gets to be absurd. I mean, there was a yoga teacher in Canada who was shamed out of uh, teaching her yoga class because, oh, it comes from India. And she, she um, tried to rename the class Mindful Stretching. Well, and I, you, you know, I find this stuff funny. Uh, well, know, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, am I it's trying afraid, to I'm afraid we can't do any more mindful know. stretching out because we're it's just not, about to finish the program. Level. I don't take it that seriously. Thank you both very much indeed. That's all we have time for tonight.